I'm glad he said elder, not old. <laughs> Although I am a little bit old, but yeah, senior. There you go, senior. All right, uh, before we get started, just a moment of silence for the Atlanta Falcons. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> just being prophetic there. Actually, uh, I would like to give just a quick word of uh, testimony. Uh, every fall, it seems like just when the little furry creatures from outside try to find a hole, you know, about that big, and they try to come on in and take up residence for the winter and gather up what seeds and food and stuff they can find. And usually, they have like one or two, you know, and you you can catch them, and that's it, right? Well, this particular winter, I've had uh, 12 mice that I've caught and, you know, threw them out for the cats in the neighborhood to come get. So now we got a regular uh, pattern that <laughs> the cats come around like, hey, what's for dinner, you know? <laughs> but uh, so I was getting a little bit upset about where in the world are all these mice coming in and, and Lord, why would you do that? And, you know, what's up with that? And uh, so one uh, couple of weeks ago, it was kind of nice out on a Saturday, and uh, I thought, man, I'm going to get to go outside and walk around the house and look around and see where I can find where in the world these mice are coming in. Well, I didn't find anything, and maybe the dryer vent is a little loose, not attached real good, but while I'm out checking that out, I'm hmm, I smell gas. So I walk around by the where the propane tank hose comes up to the house and down by the regulator, and, and I hear this. <laughs> and I thought, huh. So got down there, snip, sure enough, it's just pouring out of the regulator. Just had the tank filled, you know, like a few days earlier, and it's <laughs> going like crazy. No wonder I'm getting a low pressure alarm fault code on my water heater. So I Picked up a rocket on there and I smacked the thing, you know, and it may stop, but it's like, and, and I had called the gas company like two weeks before that and said, I'm getting this uh, error code on my water heater that says low gas pressure. Can you have a guy come out and check it? Well, two weeks goes by and I haven't seen him. So, and this was on a Saturday when this happened. So come Monday, I was right down there in their office saying, hey, uh, you got a gas leak. <laughs> you better come and, you know, get a guy over here. So the guy comes over, yep, sure enough, changes out the regulator, voila. So I said all that to say, thank you, Jesus, for the mice. <laughs> if it weren't for the mice, I probably wouldn't have went outside and checked that out and probably would have lost a whole tank of gas instead of just 150 gallons, <clears throat> you know. But, I, but I'm thankful I got it fixed, and they're going to give me some kind of credit for losing the gas. So you never know, right? All right. This morning, I would like to, uh, if you had to title this message, I would title it, You'll Never Know What God Is Saying Unless You Know What God Said. You'll never know what God is saying unless you know what he said. Well, okay, what do you mean by that? Okay, you, you run into people all the time that, you know, come up with some out-of-the-normal stuff. And you, this doesn't sound right, you know, like, but the Lord showed me this, or the Spirit of God said to do this, or, you know, God showed me this, like God showed me to, I, I have a heart for the homosexual community in San Francisco, so God showed me to divorce my wife, marry my boyfriend, and move to San Francisco, and so I can relate to these guys and minister to the lost homosexuals, right? What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> that ain't what God is saying, because that ain't what God said, right? So you 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 uh, conduct your life every day by what you know what God has already said, and also you live day by day by what He's saying, and because He's constantly saying something to us every day, He speaks to us all the time with a, with a fresh current word of God. But it's always based on the established, truthful, written word of God. And I don't know if you've been listening the last several weeks, but Bill and <coughs> Nate and Nick have all, uh, we were 
because it's, it's talking about the value of the Word of God, uh, studying the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, knowing what He said, you know, and, and getting in your Bible and, and uh, reading and studying. And that's part of what the church's job is to do, is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Um, unfortunately, I think the church has made has failed miserably in equipping the saints. Uh, we tend to keep you addicted to the preacher. Okay, come on Sunday morning, get an injection, go home. Come to a class, get the, buy this DVD, watch this TV show, get your addiction fixed, and then feel good and go re replay and repeat what you just heard said. Okay, and sometimes it's good stuff. Don't get me wrong. Um, most of it's good stuff, but it's not yours in the sense that you didn't plant the ground, plant the seed, water it, fertilize it, cultivate it, grow it, find it, dig into it, discover it. It's, you know, it's somebody else's revelation. And you know when you stand before God, you're not going to say anything about, he's not going to want to hear anything about well, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so taught me this, and so-and-so said that. He's going to want to know what you did with what he said, okay? So you've got to know it for yourself. I can't be saved for you. I can pray for your salvation, but I cannot say let him in because of me, okay? Much as I love my wife, I cannot do anything about her salvation, okay? She's on her own. Matter of fact, she heard I was preaching this morning, so she stayed home. <laughs> yeah, she'll give a count for that. Actually, she said she heard it all, all my stuff already anyway, so. Yeah, we do discuss stuff back and forth, you know, and run stuff by, or challenge each other, so, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but part of <clears throat> what we, what the, the problem is, is we, we think we hear what God is saying, and uh, sometimes, and, and I'm, you know, I'm just saying most of the time it's true and it's legit and, and all that, but we do run across uh, a period of time when it's not based on a good solid foundation. It's based on something that maybe you innocently learn, but it isn't totally, you know, correct. And so we need each other to challenge each other and correct that. Um, in Second Timothy, it, all, it talks about in the latter days, some of the things are going to happen. And one of the things that it says in 2 Timothy 3, um, in verse 6 and 7, it says they're gonna, there's going to be false teachers and they're going to be telling people a bunch of stuff and it's going to, we're, we're going to be giving all kinds of information. Okay, what, what, what age are we in? We're in the age of information. Facebook, live, YouTube, internet. Uh, this is probably the first or second time I've ever preached out of using <laughs> an electronic device, you know, instead of the actual <laughs> paper book Bible. <clears throat> but we live in that age. Well, it's an age of information. At least we get information. It's at our fingertips, you know. But the problem with that is, and just like coming and getting an injection of preaching and teaching, you're going to get all this knowledge. And the Bible says in the latter days, we'll be ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Okay, so there's a flag. That tells me that if this is what God said is going to happen, then I should be aware that I need to take steps to prevent that and avoid that and do what I can to not fall into that trap. Ever learning, ever listening, ever getting information, going to conferences all the time and reading all these other people's books all the time and eating other people's dinner all the time instead of feeding yourself, okay? And if that's how you'll know what God said, and then you'll know what he's saying, okay? I'd like to read you a definition of the truth in that verse where it says, ever learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And by the way, this is just part A of the message, okay? We'll get into part B in a minute about studying the word of God. But I'd like to put in a plug right here. And uh, first, a thank you to Nick 
actually turn me on to the Blue Letter Bible, okay? Not the B-I-B-L-E, but the B-L-B, okay? The Blue Letter Bible, it's a uh, software application that you can download for free, and it's a wonderful tool for studying the Bible. It's got translations, it's got different Bible translations, it's got uh, concordance, it's got dictionary, it's got commentary, it's got everything all at your fingertips, okay? Now, if you're old school, <coughs> right, Bill? <laughs> you, you've got these books. <laughs> if you ever been to Bill's apartment, he's got, you know, it's a bookshelf. And, um, you know, I, I, I can relate. You sit down, you open up this Bible translation, this dictionary, this kind, and you get your stuff all out there, and you can flip and look up stuff and take notes. And he has a command center, <laughs> okay? You sit on the couch. He's got this table in front of him at the top. You know, lifts up. You know, I think he's probably got book stuffed underneath there too, right? Okay. A true teacher, okay, he's got, he gets all this information and you probably get 10% of it on a Sunday morning and he's got the 90% that's still in there. So he stores it up. So that's good. Um, and, I, and I'd have to say I'm probably more old school when it comes to studying the Bible that way. It's just habit or it's just how I learned it or whatever. But I will acknowledge and accept and engage in and embrace the change in electronics. The difference is this is so fast. You can just whoop, whoop, switch between apps, look something up, go back to what you're reading. And if you really want to get into it, you can write your own notes and stuff and insert them right in a verse and all this stuff. So it's really cool. But um, it's also uh, very resourceful as far as making use of your time. You could be on the road, you could be at lunch break, you can be, you know, wherever, whenever, at the beach, studying your Bible, looking up something, checking something out, reading, whatever. So thank you, Nick, for turning me on to that. It's been very useful. I have it uh, on my iPad. I have it on my, I got stuff on my phone. I got, you know, so it's, it's all handy, right? It's very good. Anyways, here's the definition of true is that in this verse is the truth as taught in the Christian religion respecting God and the execution of his purposes through Christ and respecting the duties of man opposing the light to the superstitions of the Gentiles the inventions of the Jews and the corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers even among Christians so did you catch that key word there opinions of Christians that's probably where we get in the most trouble is opinions of Christians, okay? Obviously, superstitions are pretty obvious. We, you know, can detect a lot of that. And, and uh, I don't know what inventions of the Jews are except maybe traditions and customs they've come up with that are in addition to what God said, okay? So when they're saying this is what you got to do, this isn't what God said. But then the third part is corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers even among Christians. There's another flag that is a sign to me that says, okay, I need to be aware that that's a possibility and that that's a case where um, I have to be careful about um, engaging in conversations and being aware that opinions could be good and they could be innocent and it might be slightly off just a little bit. What, what do they say about half a bubble off and being level? Or <laughs> you know, when it's just not quite right? Anyways, um, in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 1, let's go over there. And Timothy is urging, I mean, Paul is urging Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So he's saying, take, take the things that you've heard from me, you know, and be able to teach them to others, pass it on to others. So what you're getting isn't just for yourself. You have to be equipped yourself, but it isn't just for you to hang on to and just, you know, gorge yourself on for yourself. It's to pass it on and teach others. Also, a little further down in verse 15, very familiar verse that we've all heard, I'm sure. 
study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I had a, I did a little looking on that about rightly dividing the word of truth. And the only thing that I could think of is my wife used to sew uh, a lot, and she would sometimes have me, not when she was sewing, but there have been occasions where I had to cut either a, a piece of uh, a runner for a tablecloth, you know, the plastic runners on tables, or cut a piece of material for something, and man, I'm like, you know, I'm I'm cutting, and it's like, woo, the cricket is all get out, right? Well, she can take a pair of scissors and take up a piece of material and straight as an arrow. And how do you do that? You know, straight as an arrow. She can just cut it with no ruler, no mark, no line, just nothing, just cut. <laughs> and if you've ever been to a shop, Joanne Fabrics or wherever, and bought material, and you watch these people that do this every day, man, they take a pair of scissors and they didn't even have to do this necessarily. Sometimes they just hold it just right and you know, well, they cut it straight, and that's the definition of rightly dividing the word of God. We cut it straight, okay? Not crooked, cut it straight. And it's interesting that uh, I looked up the word sword in the Bible and in the Old Testament, it's like 400 and some times, and the New Testament, it's about 29 times or so with the word sword. And a sharp sword will do what? Cut. And you can cut straight and use a sword to cut with or to correctly divide. Okay? Ever seen a master butcher at work? <laughs> Man, he can <laughs> cut you a nice, you know, without cutting himself all up. They can, or fillet a fish. Man, I've seen guys take a, within like 10 seconds. <laughs> I do that and I've lost half the meat, you know, with the fish and got it all butchered and I mean literally butchered, not not filleted, butchered, but the word of God or Paul is comparing the word of God to a sword, okay? The take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we can use the word of God to cut it straight. Okay? We can use the word of God to cut it straight. God says that in Hebrews, it says the word that God speaks is sharp, it's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. So the word of God is even sharper than a piece of, uh, than a sword or an item that can cut it straight. So the word of God is sharper than that. There's another clue for us of what, how, how important that is for us to know what God said. Because the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to get right down to, and I'll paraphrase it here, it's able to get right down to our motive. Ooh, that's pretty sharp. You get down to your motive. The word of God can cut and divide and just get past all the fluff and the muscle and the the tough stuff and all that, and get right down between the joints and marrows, right into the motive of your heart. That's pretty sharp. Okay? Again, this is just all part A, okay, of leading you up to <laughs> part B. All right. Um, another verse, uh, well known, well heard, read a lot. Second Timothy. 3.16, it tells you what the Word of God is good for. I'm sure most of you can quote it, right? The Word of God is, the Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. That's a mouthful right there. The Word of God is inspired by God, scriptures are inspired by God, and it's profitable for doctrine. Okay, doctrine is what you basically defined as what you base your faith on. Doctrine is the thing that, unfortunately, we add to. <laughs> okay, but at the same time, correct doctrine is your your total foundation, what you base your faith on. Okay, you got to have. 
true doctrine. I've had a lot of doctrine in my life, being raised Catholic, and went to catechism class, and every grade through school, you had a religion class. I mean, all the way up through senior in high school, each year, religion class was one of the subjects every year, okay? Um, one of the things that we didn't do when our kids were growing up is sit down and have a lot of Bible studies and devotionals with them. <gasps> Are you kidding me? Well, they went to church every Sunday, okay, and they went to a Christian school every day of their school life, and so they had plenty of doctrine, okay? They had plenty of stuff, bleh, stuff, okay? And we didn't want to stuff them with more knowledge, more facts and figures. So instead, here's our novel concept. Just try demonstrating the Christian life in your walk. Right? Stand at the cash register and the lady gives you 53 cents change extra. And it's like, oh, ma'am, I don't think this is right. And your kid's standing right there and they're watching. And you say, ma'am, you get your keep. Oh, that's all right. Just keep it. You, that's all right. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. This is too much. You give me the wrong change. You know? Or, here's my favorite, sitting at the restaurant, man, this hamburger is nasty. This is dry as a bone. Ah, oh, this is terrible. And these fries are like, you know, been in a potato since last winter in storage. You know, and you, man, man, man. And then you go to the cash register and you pay and your child is right there. Well, how was everything, sir? Oh, it was fine. Right? You're lying through your teeth after you just got through complaining about how nasty it was. And then they tell them, oh, everything was just fine. And so, you know, and the day before, you just thank your child for lying to you about who took the cookie out of the cookie jar. Don't you lie to me. Child is confused. It's like, I can lie about the cookie and get spanked. He can lie to the cashier at the restaurant and not, you know, what's up with that? It doesn't. So when you teach, you're, you're doing more than just stuffing yourself full of knowledge and facts and figures, okay? So scripture is good for doctrine. It's good for um, reproof. Reproof meaning you need change, uh, you need to be corrected, you need to be reproved by God, and sometimes we may have to reprove one another. You know, horrible thought that we would just be so offended that somebody telling me that, you know, hey, you're, uh, what you're doing and what you're saying and how you're acting is affecting uh, others you know, in, the, in the wrong way or in a bad way, you know, and we get so touchy about being reproved or corrected, but yet it says scripture is good for that. I would think if I was walking around, uh, you know, with my shoelace untied and somebody says, hey, man, your shoes are untied. Oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> I went on a trip. You know, how about, you know, discussing the word of God when you're, when you're acting wacko and somebody comes alongside, you know, for your good, for your benefit and says, Man, you're messing up. This, you know, this isn't right, and you need to, you know, we need to take a look at this. So don't be afraid to be to challenge someone, but also don't be afraid to reprove correction and reproof either. Okay, in this age of what's the word? Snowflake. <laughs> it's my favorite new word. Snowflake. You know, somebody that's so touchy feely that they, you can't do nothing, tell them nothing. They're just so offended. Anyways, we, we won't go there. Okay, the word of God, it's good for correction, it's good for instruction in righteousness. And I like the fact that the scriptures don't just beat us up, okay? Correction, 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 correction. You did this wrong, you messed up, you failed, shape up, fly right, correction, correction, correction. And if that's all we did, we would walk out of here feeling condemned and beat up, right? But it also says it's good for instruction in righteousness. Don't just show me what I did wrong or correct me for what I'm doing wrong. Tell me how to fly right. Okay? Tell me how to live right. Tell me how, uh, you know, what, 
what we should be learning and what we should be doing and how we should be acting. And um, it's not just always, you know, telling somebody how they failed. I, I am related to a family uh, <laughs> that was, nobody could measure up. The dad was a perfectionist. Even though he didn't practice what he preached, he d expected others to measure up. And in his eyes, they could never measure up. We would tell them what they were doing wrong or tell them how stupid they were or tell them his favorite expression is you couldn't figure your way out of a wet paper bag. Now that's really, you know, encouraging <laughs> to, to tell me that. Well, maybe, uh, well, how about you show me how to get my way out of a wet paper bag, you know, instead of just telling me I can't figure it out. So the scriptures, I, I love this. It's right in the very same verse, the next word. It's with the correction, with the instruction in righteousness, okay? Build up, stir up, cheer up. That's what the, the prophetic is good for. It build us up, and exhort us, encourage us, stir us up to love and good works. Okay. Um, now, here's something that uh, we'll learn. Um, I was reading along in Hebrews, and it talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Who can tell me? Bill, you don't. This, you, you guys right here don't count until you. Okay. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Huh? Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. What else? Huh? Aaron's rod and manna. Good. Good. Okay. We know what the Ten Commandments was, right? That was Moses went up to the mountain. This is what God said. Thou shalt not thou do this, honor your father, your mother, you know, blah, 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 da, 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 ten commandments. That's what he said. And that was put in the Ark of the Covenant. What was manna? Hmm? Manna was the food that they ate, and if they gathered too much, what? And if you didn't get enough, it was enough for the day, right? Was it good for tomorrow? No. Fresh. Fresh. Every day baked fresh from heaven, right? So that was what God is saying. Okay? Tablets, commandments are what God said. And manna represents fresh, new every day. God is saying. Now we got the third item. The rod of Aaron. What did the rod do that was really unique? It budded leaves, almond leaves, okay, which tells me that it was alive. It wasn't a dead stick. Now, I can beat you up with the word of God, okay, and be a dead letter, or I can use that rod, which is used for correction, okay, beat you up with it, or it can be alive, the word of God can be alive in me, sharper than any two-edged sword, and can it discern between the, even the motive of my heart, I can correct with it, or if I was a shepherd and I had a staff and I could lead with it, okay? Also, if I was a king, I would have a rod or a scepter, which is what I ruled with, which also represented authority. So if you look at the word of God as what God said, what God's saying is good for ruling, it's good for ruling your life, it has authority, and it has life in it, okay? And to me, that's the most precious thing is that it isn't dead, it isn't just historical document, it is alive, it's fresh every day if you listen to what God is saying, and you, but you have to know what God said. Okay. So let's go to part B. How to study the Bible. I'm going to take a little quick survey. I'm guessing, and just raise your hand if you're more than this, but the average person has probably been in at least five, six churches. If you've been in at least since you've been a Christian, at least, say, five or more churches, raise your hand. Wow, 
pretty good. I'd say most of it would be most everybody. Now, of all the churches you've been in, I'm sure they talked about the need for knowing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, handling the Word of God, appreciating the Word of God, living the Word of God. So how many, and I would like a show of hands if you want to, have actually taught you of all those churches you've been in actually how to study the Word of God? Raise your hand. One, two, three, not so many hands. Okay, and that's the part that that was my real heart, my real passion uh, for this is it's great to talk about it and it's, and it's great to you know to hear it and to hear it preached and and God bless teachers, okay, because they they just give you all kinds of good stuff. But what they got, they glean somehow, and you can glean and get the same stuff. And you can then share that also. Just for a quick example, um, I read the verse that in Second Timothy uh, 2, it says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So is he saying it's just good for men? would you know if he was saying that's just to teach for faithful men? 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That the man of God, how would we know if that's for just men or is it for women too? How do we know that? This is where the study come, part comes in. You can read the Word of God and sit home and do your daily devotional, and you can read that. You could probably read it in several different translations, but if you actually look up the Word, it's the word we get anthropology from, the word for man. It's the word anthropo, okay, which means what? Mankind. That's men and women. So if I want to just be letter of the law, literal, that the man of God may to teach to other men, I could become wacko in my thinking and preaching and teaching by speaking my opinion of what I think that said, because it says teach to other men, right? Well, that's not what it says. It says who teach to all mankind. And so there's a way, just one, just one small thing. Um, one of my favorite uh, test words is what's a heretic? Okay, well, a heretic is someone that advocates heresy, right? And heresy is what? Hmm? Hearsay? hearsay? Here, heresy is hearsay. Yeah, actually, it could be firsthand knowledge. Actually, it's just an opinion. In its simplest form, heresy means it's an opinion. Well, my opinion is that it says that the man of God should be able to teach other men also. That would be my opinion. But if I push that opinion to the point of saying that's doctrine and all of you who agree with me, we're going to meet on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock at this address and we're going to form the church that believes in teaching that faithful men. Okay, now I just pushed my opinion to the point of doctrine and to the point of divisiveness and gathering followers after myself. That's heresy. That's the definition of heresy. Okay? Generally speaking, you wouldn't know what that is unless you, you know, you got into it and you studied it. So, um, I got a little object lesson here. We all have our own unique methods of how we study the Bible, right? <clears throat> Several years ago, we went on a little vacation and we went up north to a uh, amethyst mine. There's several of them up along the Canadian path there. And as you can see, we've I got this rock right here with amethyst in it. Genuine amethyst. Okay. And basically, this is you put it, they give you a bucket and a shovel, and, and you kind of just go walk out in this 
big old area of hills and valleys and pits and piles of stones and rocks, and you just kind of look around and, you know, do a little digging, and voila, this is like right there. I thought, well, that's pretty cool, okay? But that was on the surface. That was easy to find right on the surface. And if all you do is just read the Word of God or do a devotional book along with, read this chapter or just follow this devotional, this is what you get right here. This is an image of the real amethyst. And it's a gem, so it's precious. Okay, And if you just do that uh, type of study, if you want to call it that, that's what you get. You'll get some gems. You'll get some you know, truth. You'll get the real genuine article. You'll, you'll get the Word of God. But to me, that was right on the surface. Didn't take a whole lot of effort. That's not what you really want. Right? That is not what you really want. What you really want is that right there. That was not laying on the surface. That is one rock right there, pure amethyst. Okay? Genuine article but you didn't find that laying on the surface. You have to do a little digging to get that. Okay? And, uh, of course, the analogy is pretty simple, right? If you study the Word of God, you'll get, you'll get some of that. And you can live on that for a while. But if you really want to be a man of God, woman of God, thoroughly equipped, able to teach others, able to stand in the day when it's not easy to stand, what you want is this right here, a real nugget, a real gem, okay? So short version, how do I do that? You need tools to do that. Now, I've got right here electronically a dictionary, a Bible dictionary, okay? Uh, Webster was pretty good. I think he might have even been a Christian, okay? But a Webster dictionary is not going to get it for studying your Bible. You need a Bible dictionary, okay? Why? Because <laughs> there's going to be the Webster's dictionary changed over the years, okay? If you look up the word gay in Webster's dictionary, it ain't the same as the dictionary Webster wrote 50 years ago, <laughs> okay? Okay, you look up the word, you know, you name it, definitions and all these things have changed. But if you have a Bible dictionary, guess what? It's going to be the word that the Bible was written with. It's going to give you, from a godly perspective, what those words mean. So right off the bat, you need a Bible dictionary, okay? Number two, you should have a concordance, which is at least... Uh, what I would call a, a simple version, or has a simple one-line definition of the text. Every word that's in the Bible, let's be in the concordance. Every one of you should own a concordance. If you want to look up a word, you can find it in there. It lists every word in the Bible, okay? It even lists, uh, and it gives you whether it's Hebrew word or a Greek word, and then typically in the back of the concordance there's a dictionary and it's a brief dictionary like I said it's a one liner it'll get you <laughs> it'll get you this okay an expository dictionary uh, or an actual literal translation along with an expository dictionary will get you this you'll find uh, more information like the W.E. Vine Vine's dictionary is uh, called an expository dictionary. It's a really good tool. Um, there's others out there that are good Bible dictionaries. If you go to the Christian bookstore in Grand Rapids on Cascade, right by 28th Street, they have a used book section. And you get all these college students from Bible colleges that when they're done or they drop out, uh, the same for me, <laughs> guess where their books end up? <laughs> Here, you want this book? Or I'm done with year one and I'm going to year two and that's a different set of books and they trade those in and they get some new ones and you can pick up deals on, on 
books are going. You can order online uh, through one of them is Abe Books, A B E. Um, there's all kind of Amazon, you know, Tom Griffin, okay, and all. You can get all kinds of dictionaries, concordances, and all that at cheap, cheap. The other thing is, you got to, by default, you got to have a Bible, right? <laughs> Sem- yeah. You got to have a Bible. Well, what Bible should I use? Aren't they all the same? No, <laughs> they're not. You've got Bible translations. You have Bible paraphrases. You have Bible reading, Bible for reading. It makes it just easy to sit down and read. You have Bibles that are just today's language, which is like the Living Bible or uh, the Message. Okay, excellent, excellent Bible for reading and getting the concept across. Well, if you want to study the Bible, there's the appropriate translation for studying it. And so all I'm saying is you got to have the tools to put and if you go electronically, uh, the Blue Letter Bible software application is an excellent tool, and it has several translations in there that you can look at, and it will give you the Greek word or the Hebrew word, and you can look it up in their dictionary, and you can look it up. There's several commentaries on there. Now, the commentary is where you have to be careful because it's going to depend on what denomination that person is with is going to re- be reflected in his commentary but there's good information in there, good historical information about the customs of the day and why it was significant about how there were certain taxes that they had to pay in that day and there were certain um, things that they did, just the way of life that you will learn from commentaries or uh, uh, books about the Bible or about that culture, okay, like historians, for example. So, it's just a whole wide variety of things that you can do. And <clears throat> what we don't want to be guilty of here as human life is just keeping you addicted to the preaching, okay? We want to equip you thoroughly to do uh, what, you, what we should be able to be doing, stand on our own two feet, give a reason for the hope that's within me. And if somebody challenges me about my faith, I should be able to tell them why I believe what I believe. And when I have the dilemma of, should I take this job? Should I marry this person? Should I move to this city? What should I do? I'll need to know what God is saying based on what I know he said. And if you'll do that, you'll hear from God. He'll direct you. And you're standing in line at uh, wherever, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, Kmart, Walmart, wherever. And the person in front of you uh, is standing there, and if God is saying, buy that person a meal, you know, pay it forward, or ask them how they're doing today, or can I pray for you today? There is something unique and precious about having a fresh word from God, okay, by what he's saying. But also, when you're engaged in conversation and somebody tells you what God is saying to them, and it's out there, you're like, mm, that doesn't quite line up with what he said, okay? But you'll have to know what he said. So, uh, hopefully, that just gives you, uh, what's your appetite a little bit about, okay, here's the need, here's how you could go about it, and if there was enough interest in a class or in going through all that stuff, and enough people came forward and said, hey, we'd like to do a class on that, then we would do that. But my desire today was just to give you uh, an appetizer, okay, make you hungry, um, and the, the desire to know God and know who he is and what he thinks of me is all there, and it's available to us. It's not a secret, okay? But again, one more time, you can get this or you can get this. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that your word is true. It hasn't changed. You haven't changed. And you've made this all available to us. And uh, we just thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, how you provide, how you take care of us, and how you walk with us, how your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all the truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.